All right, welcome to Move Your Body in Habitat. We are talking about building the future of the outdoor movement movement today. I'm Charlie Deist. I run a primal movement group here in Berkeley, California, and I'm co-hosting this workshop with the one and only Frank Ferencic of Exuberant Animal. In a second, I'm gonna give a bit of background on Frank and how I came to know him, but first I wanna give a quick outline of where we're going today. Frank is going to open up with some of his recent observations. Uh, we, we just went through this Olympic events of 2020, 2021, whatever the postponed title was, uh, but he's also gonna look more broadly at human beings through the lens of long history, big history. And Frank has a perspective that infects you and you can never think the same way again after hearing his perspective. We're gonna take turns then talking about some examples of the model that we think is more appropriate than this sports competition model that the Olympic offers, uh, more appropriate for the times that we're living through. And we hope that this conversation will inspire other people to get out into their own bioregions, into your habitats and start making a difference locally. I'm also gonna ask Frank to clarify some terminology that gets misused the language that we use is extremely important. This is another lesson that I've learned from Frank. And we're going to dig into the fundamental concepts that can guide us into more relevant forms of movement, concepts and principles that will grow this movement outside of its little niche in spaces like MoveNet, Primal Movement, Edo Portal, all of these modalities that we can appreciate for what they are. But we want to grow this movement into something that can be embraced more by the outside world. So if you're a gym owner, if you're a trainer, or if you're just someone who's looking to relate to your habitat and to your body in a different way, I promise that this information will be highly relevant to you, including if you're a business owner uh, in the quote unquote fitness space um, to your business plan. And I think that Frank has actually sort of seen into the future. Incidentally, he's done this by looking carefully at the past. And if you wanna ride the wave that's coming, it's about to hit us. It's going to be a hell of a ride. I'll, I'll tell you that much. Then, then do stay tuned. And then finally, we're going to put out a special call for leaders in this space. We're going to define a challenge for those leaders, some action steps. Uh, we want to have you send us a picture and we'll talk more about what the, the picture entails. But now I want to talk a little bit more about Frank in case you don't already know him. Frank graduated from Stanford in the late 70s with a degree in human biology, and he's a black belt in Aikido and Karate, a climber, an author of many amazing books, including most recently The Sapiens Curriculum, Teacher's Guide for an Age of Turmoil. And Frank is perhaps best known for his in-person teachings. He's a speaker and a movement teacher, and he brings these together in a lot of his conference presentations. Uh, those include forums like the Ancestral Health Symposium. He's spoken at Google and General Electric on the, the other side of the, the spectrum. And then he also hosts his own Outback experiences up in Oregon where he lives. And the last time Frank and I talked, he described these conferences to me. They, they sound sort of like unconferences in a way. It's a, a mixture of presentations and the intellectual material, but there's a main emphasis on this outdoor movement component. Frank's website is Exuberant Animal. That's uh, exuberantanimal.com, I believe. And you should check out his books, his Facebook page and YouTube channel if you wanna learn more about what his teachings look like in practice. I interviewed Frank last year at the beginning of the pandemic when there was a lot of uncertainty about things like travel and in-person events. The gyms were closed and I wanted to pick his brain about what the essentials of an outdoor fitness community should or could look like. Now, Frank was too diplomatic at the time to take issue with my using the term fitness, but I've since learned from him the ways that this term fitness is kind of a loaded word or that it's much abused, sort of like the terms nature or all natural or environment, environmental. Um, and I think we in the fitness quote unquote industry have to really rethink this language if we want to stay relevant. So I put this interview with Frank along with five of my other favorite interviews from that podcast series 
into the form of a little book that uh, I called The New Strongman Code, subtitle Building Resilient Physical Subculture Post-COVID. And in the course of editing these transcripts, I realized that there was uh, a much bigger project underway here than I had initially expected. So fitness or exercise is one of these modern boxes that we're supposed to check off, like brushing our teeth or going to the doctor. But I think that you'll find that Frank's way of looking at the world makes it so that you can never really look at movement or health in the same way. I started reading Frank's newest book, The Sapiens Curriculum, and it seemed like on each page I was reading something. He was expressing these ideas that I felt like I could have written myself, but only because I had first had this conversation with Frank that had shaken my perspective on what my role is as a trainer. And the name of the book, again, is The Sapiens Curriculum, Teacher's Guide for an Age of Turmoil. So faced with this prospect of all these different crises, both real and, and imagined, I would add, uh, most of us are at a complete loss for how to think and act effectively. And in this confusion, we sometimes feel it in our bodies. It's an artifact of a neglect of our bodies and a neglect of our local environment. When you compare our lives to the lives of native peoples that lived in, let's just say where I am now here in Berkeley, I know next to nothing about the plants, the animals, the ecology. In short, I know almost nothing about the habitat that humans have called home here for thousands of years. And then on top of that, we've built into our society this mismatch. That's another term that Frank uses a lot between our ancestors, biological rhythms, and then this modern world that we've built it makes it really hard to get to know our habit habitat well enough to be able to actually do anything to nurture it properly. And this is where the modern environmental movement, I think, tends to fail, sometimes even spectacularly, thinks that it can just outsmart Mother Nature. Take an example that I got from Frank recently, which would be electric cars, where we think that we've uh, created this, this great new technology and maybe that something will come out of it. But in the meantime, we are using the new technology to, to strip mine or we require things like strip mining. And these technologies that seem environmentally friendly are often just shifting the destruction to different areas. So what we're going to be talking about today is how that mismatch in our environments is manifested, particularly in the realm of sports, fitness and exercise, and how we can recover instead an authentic practice of moving our bodies in our habitats. And that job, it's a really monumental task. It requires new kinds of leaders and communities along with that to help people reconnect with their bodies within their local bioregion. So toward that end, uh, I'm gonna be giving away the PDF version of the book that I compiled, which features Frank's uh, excellent interview, which I, I highly recommend. You can find that on my website, anaturalmethod.com slash strongman dash code. And I'm also gonna share uh, some examples of moving in habitat that have been effective in solidifying a tribe of people here in Berkeley. So I've been talking a whole lot, uh, but I want to bring Frank in here and also put in one more plug for Frank's new book, uh, which I really recommend. It's called The Sapiens Curriculum, Teacher's Guide in an Age of Turmoil. Frank, I think that you have a, a sample chapter up on your website, and I want to confirm, did I get the name of your website right? Is it exuberantanimal.com? That's right, yes. And I believe there is a sample chapter in there somewhere, yes. So check that out. I guarantee you, when you by the time you read to the end of the sample chapter, you'll want to read more of these little vignettes. Uh, and and there, we were just talking before the before we went live about uh, the sort of the, the yard sale approach, um, which is maybe you can can talk a little bit about that your approach to writing. But in particular, uh, I want to ask you, who did you write this book, The Sapiens Curriculum, for? Well, I've been involved in teaching and education in different forms for a long time. And I actually was a teacher for a while in a, in a school system. I was a substitute teacher and I went through the teaching education program. And I was so frustrated by it that I spent the following year in the library <laughs> reading about education. And so I, that's a subject that's really near and dear to my heart, this, uh, the plight of the modern teacher and what is happening in school system. So in part, that book is for teachers, really of all kinds. 
Okay, now I, I teased at the beginning that we were going to be talking about the Olympics, and I do want to touch on this a little bit before sort of opening up the floor to you to go over maybe just a couple of the core insights. Or it, it's more, I find that in reading these chapters in the book, uh, that there is a, there's a way of thinking that underlies it. So I, I talked about principles, but it's even even more than principles. I feel like there's something about the way that you write that brings me into a different way of thinking um, and, and maybe we can just start with how does the exuberant animal watch the olympics and what is that experience like uh, what what are your observations from from coming off of the last few weeks where we've had all these intense competitions of people in uh, hyper specialized sports right well it's not just the olympics i i've recently watched the nba finals and over the last couple of years, um, the movie called Free Solo with Alex Honnold. And all three of these things I find to be really curious and really, you know, I always take a big history perspective on the body and the human experience. And all three of these things stand out to me as being very, at, at least curious, but maybe even completely irrelevant to this situation that we're living in now. And I watch the Olympics, I enjoy the Olympics, and I'm even occasionally inspired by the Olympics. But on the other hand, I have to ask, what is the point? What is the point of developing a really high level of skill in a movement specialty? In, in a specialization. And that's historically really abnormal. We haven't ever tried to do that kind of thing before. We've been hunter gatherers and scavengers in natural environments, but never have we specialized so narrowly in something. And that's, that's unprecedented in our history. And I have to wonder what purpose that really serves. So that, that's a conversation we could have at some point, but I've really been a, a observer of Olympics and professional sports and these these physical feats that we do now uh, to stand out. And I have to wonder if they're really that valuable. I think that you used a term to describe Alex Honnold's free solo climbs and in particular that one up El Capitan as uh, it was something like incredible but profoundly disturbing. Right. And, it, and it's, it's also a reflection of modern culture and this, this bias towards the individual and this rise in narcissism that we've seen throughout the last uh, 100 years. And this has been well documented by psychologists who do the, do the research. And narcissism is a big deal now in modern culture. Um, David Brooks, uh, he's a columnist at the New York Times, he writes about this and he, he talks about what he calls the big me, the selfie culture, and this too is historically abnormal, this, this really intense focus on individual performance and individual welfare, that's a radical departure from our historical focus on tribal welfare, and so that's that's another conversation that we need to have at some point too for sure and i want to deliver on the, the promise that i made at the beginning of the presentation which is to provide people who are thinking about becoming leaders or maybe who, who already consider themselves to be leading leading people in this space of health wellness maybe even they are still thinking of it in terms of, of a fitness industry um, how they might shift their perspective and see the bigger picture, uh, including maybe a, a little dose of big history. Um, so do you want to, at this time, just kind of go into your presentation? Uh, we, can, we can do that, and then we can talk more about some, some examples of how we might shift the focus of uh, what people who are in trainer roles, coaches, gyms, might do to get away from this hyper-individualized, hyper-competitive world into something that maybe is more compatible with our ancestral origins. Right. And the big history perspective is so essential because you can't know who you are unless you know your ancestry. And this is something that we might be forgiven for not knowing and not appreciating because the big history perspective has only come into focus over the last few decades. I mean, we didn't have 
a really clear understanding of our hominid origins until beginning probably in the 1960s with some of the big fossil finds in um, East Africa. And then the, the discovery of DNA and more discoveries of fossilized remains that tell us that we have this big history, 300,000 years for Homo sapiens, and only a tiny piece of that is what we call the modern world. So that brings into a, a whole new light the question of what's normal and what's abnormal. And this is something I have in the book is a, a complete accounting of what's normal for the human species and what's abnormal in the modern world. And the, the contrast is just striking. I mean, for, for people living in most of human history, the overwhelming percentage of human history, that was outdoor living. That was tribal living. That was living with direct sensory contact with habitat. That was normal. And now almost every feature, every dimension of the modern world is historically abnormal. So we're living in an alien environment and that's, that's the challenge of mismatch. And we've got to take that serious as trainers and leaders. If you don't take mismatch seriously, if you don't take our history seriously, then you're just kind of shooting in the dark. And that's what I see in a lot of the, the modern fitness culture. And, and the title of this workshop or conversation is Moving Your Body in Habitat, which is a, a euphemism in some ways for, for exercise, <laughs> or if we're trying to avoid that, that those terms, um, why are those terms problematic in your mind? Things like fitness or exercise. Right, well, fit, the word fitness the origins, the roots of that word come from the world of biology. And in that world, they use the word fitness to describe reproductive success. So if you can have a lot of viable offspring, then you're considered fit. And it's got nothing to do with muscular capacity, not necessarily, or cardiovascular capacity. Fitness is just the ability to leave lots of viable offspring. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. So when people in the exercise community come in and use the word fitness, it becomes really confusing because in these two domains, the word fitness means very different things. And as for the word exercise, that's a completely modern construct. You don't see exercise in non-human animals. Um, I've been to Africa, I've been to Gambia, I've been out with the chimpanzees. There's nothing resembling exercise. These are non-human animals that hunt, they play, they wrestle with each other, they climb trees, and they adventure. Um, sometimes they even have battles with opposing tribes, but um, they don't exercise ever. No clipboards, no accounting of how many sets and reps, none of that. So what we are doing in the fitness community is historically abnormal. And you've got to wonder why we're doing that. I mean, why can't we live out our heritage as animals in natural habitat? So the, you know, the word exercise is problematic. The word fitness is problematic. And this is a question I've been wanting to ask you for a while is, when we talk about human habitat, it's easy to place something like a gorilla or a chimpanzee in their natural habitat, which they've maybe occupied for, you know, you talked about the scale of Homo sapiens in terms of hundreds of thousands of years, but some animals have been occupying a relatively similar environmental niche for millions of years. Whereas humans, it seems like one of our defining traits is that we change our habitat or we change our environment. And so how can we speak of a natural human animal habitat in a sense. Right, well, this might be a good time to um, present my slideshow because I do have some pictures that uh, would suggest that. Please, okay. go ahead. So I'm gonna set a little bit of context and then drop in. Do, does that look, show up for looks you? Looks good, looks good. So I always, whenever I do a workshop or presentation, I always start with this, the state of the animal or primates predicament. And we talk about health and the, the often disturbing state of health for modern human animals. But um, it's always about context. And so 
for me, the planet is the elephant in the room. That's what we have to be talking about. That is the biggest possible context. And things are not looking good. If you even pay a little bit of attention to events on the planet, this is, this is what we're up against. And the planet, the biosphere, that is our life support system. And that's a brute force fact. There's no, no way to get around that. Some people think it's the economy, but no, that without a planet, without a biosphere, you can't have an economy either. So this is, this is the ground truth for what we have to deal with. And I'll let you read this. Me uh, or, or people, I'll, I'll go ahead, I'll read it out loud if I may, uh, from here. From here on, the primary judgment of all human institutions, professions, programs, and activities will be determined by the extent to which they inhibit, ignore, or foster a mutually enhancing human-Earth relationship. Right. Now, this is Thomas Berry, and he is somewhat famous for being an eco-theologian. He, he's often talked about the great work of reweaving human beings back into the biosphere. And what he's doing here, he's putting out a call for relevance. He's saying, can you draw a line between your career, your profession, your sport, whatever it happens to be, and the state of the planet? And if you can't draw some kind of line there, then, then it remains to be seen what you're really doing. And, and this is another contextual thing. Go ahead and read this. We are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and stars. We have broken the great conversation. Right, and so again, he's talking about the great work, the challenge ahead of us for the next thousand years is going to be reweave humans back into the biosphere in some way. So that's the challenge. Now, we also hear from Naomi Klein and she puts it real clear. When the system on which life depends start to collapse, all other problems fit inside that problem. In other words, the biosphere, the state of the biosphere is the alpha issue of the day. Everything else is subordinate to that. And the problem is the culture is not given as much guidance here. Our standard narrative that we've lived with for the last thousand years, 2000 years perhaps, is the man over nature narrative. And a lot of people, especially young people are starting to realize that that narrative is not giving us the guidance that we seek. And in, in a normal culture, culture gives us a roadmap, culture gives us a guidance for how to proceed. And we're not getting that anymore. So we're in real trouble in that respect too. And a lot of people are starting to wonder, am I relevant? Am I relevant to the world? Is my life having any impact, any bearing on what's going on? Do I matter? And of course, we talked about mismatch and the problem. This is you might call a veterinary approach to the human animal. And here we've got our, on the left, we've got our historical norm. That's where we've lived for thousands of generations and every detail of our body, of our physiology, our anatomy and our psychology is the way it is because of that experience. And now we're trying to live in this alien world, this alien environment, and some people do okay. And some people are able to thrive even in that alien environment, but a lot of people are not. And the trouble here is that if you have trouble adapting to this modern alien environment, we put the focus on the individual, don't we? That we say, well, there's something wrong with you or there's something wrong with me if I can't adapt to that world. But really from an animal point of view, it's not at all surprising that we're having trouble adapting to this modern world. And here it is. I mean, look at all the features of the modern world that assault us. Everything from sedentary living, fake food, chronic noise, chronic stress, sleep deprivation, tribal ambiguity, hyper cleanliness, nature deprivation. Almost everything about the modern world is challenging to the human organism. It's also incredibly stressful. The 
the letters here on this teeter-totter. On the left is SNS for sympathetic nervous system, or on the other side, a parasympathetic nervous system. The modern world tends to keep us in a state of chronic stress. And one thing, one consequence of this is that so many of us revert to what's familiar. When we're really stressed and we are under assault by too much complexity and too many problems, then we go back to what we know, and that's the modern world. We revert to the familiar, and that's why we're having so much trouble changing right now. We do what we, what we know. So back in the paleo, what was it like? What would your life have been like in the paleo? And of course, the cartoon here is that we're always thinking about cavemen, right? brutish cavemen, but there's so much more to it than that. And these people living in natural outdoor environments, these are homo sapiens. These people are just as intelligent and possibly more intelligent than we. And they're living in a very enriched environment. And this is their, this is their experience of plants, animals, weather, and all the rest. So it's a physical challenge, but it's also a sensory challenge. And that's what we forget. We think of them as athletes. And to be sure, many of them probably were. And to be sure, being an athlete would help in that kind of environment. But that's not the only thing. You have to be highly sensitive to your habitat if you want to survive. And I mean, look at the predicament. These are, these are Bushmen in Africa, modern day Bushmen in Africa. And so much of your survival would depend on having an oral tradition and having a group, a cohesive group that you could depend on. And that's, that's fundamental to being alive. Hadza Bushmen in East Africa. You gotta wonder what these guys were talking about around the campfire and I didn't speak their language, but I could tell you they weren't talking about gluten and they weren't talking about sugar and they weren't talking about who can run the fastest. No, they were talking about the animals, they were talking about plants, and, they were, and for sure they were talking about gossip um, of how things were going in camp. But by and large, they were talking about habitat. That's the focus. And I this book was so huge a few years ago, and I read it, of course, and I think that Christopher McDougall wrote an entertaining book, but I think it also uh, did a disservice to us in a lot of ways, because for him, it was all about performance. It was all about how fast you could run and how far you could run, and he didn't show the depth and complexity of the paleo experience. He didn't talk about the paleolithic predicament and primal people and their experience, the emphasis on sensation and natural history. He didn't talk about that much. It was all about athletes. Now, I wanna give you a great example of how paleo people would integrate with the modern world. And this comes from Australia. And if you have seen any pictures at all of the outback in Australia, you know that it's a pretty featureless land. There aren't a lot of landmarks, and it would be really easy to get lost in a place like this. So the aboriginals had a, a cultural um, method for dealing with this. And they got to know their habitat, and they had particular places in habitat where they would sing particular songs at a particular time of year. And what this did for them was serve as touchstones or anchors in habitat. So imagine you go on a walkabout and you might be out for a day or a week or a month, whatever it is, and you go to different places, different um, hills perhaps, different ravines, different places where there were water or different kinds of animals, and you would sing a particular song in that place. And that held everything together that gave their culture a sense of integration with the land, vitally important for their survival. And today, Australian Aborigines are completely mystified by the way that white people go around with their phones and they can have songs 
anywhere they want that are independent of the land. They find that to be incomprehensible. For them, the song served a purpose at a particular place in a particular time. And we could do that. We could do that again. So this is a way that their culture was so sophisticated and we lose, we lose sight of that. So eco-psychology, this is vital for understanding any of this. How big are we? Where is the me? Where does the me begin? Where does the me stop? This is essential. For, for native people, the me was much bigger than the body itself. We related to habitat. So attachment to habitat is a human universal. And it, it occurred so much in prehistory that we have to consider it to be normal. So when you hear native people talk about, I am the land, the land is me. I am the river, the river is me. I am the forest, the forest is me. That's normal. That's the way normal human beings speak. We are the abnormal ones in that sense. Now this attachment to habitat is similar to the way we attach to people. We attach to mom or our caregiver when we're infants. That's fundamental to all human beings, all human development. We attach to habitat in much the same way. And you probably remember the habitat of your youth, of your infancy. And you remember the textures and the plants and animals that lived in your habitat. This is fundamental to who we are. So the other theme that comes up here over and over again is biophilia. E.O. Wilson talking about this, this biological urge to affiliate with other forms of life or to affiliate with habitat. This is normal for human beings. We all have done this until quite recently. And it brings up this idea is some of the other sporting things that we are doing right now. Nike has this multi-million dollar project to get the marathon time below two hours. And from a paleo point of view, from my point of view, this is, this is a complete sideshow. This is completely irrelevant to what's going on in the modern world right now. Just because you can get the time down below two hours, does that even mean anything? Does that have any consequence to it? Or is it just a stunt? Is it just a feat? And I would, I would suggest that it, it doesn't really have much relevance. If they do this, if they succeed in this, the world will not be really any different. So what I propose is an emphasis on bioregional athletics. Let us identify the bioregion that we're in and try and create sports and athletics activities that are consistent with the plants and animals that are on the ground. And this is a new idea, but it's actually a really old idea. A lot of people that I've talked to, they don't even know what a bioregion is, but if you pay attention, you'll know. I mean, that it's very easy. You go on a road trip and you say, wow, the plants and the animals are different here than they were 100 miles ago. You know that each bioregion has its own characteristic. So why not make our sports consistent with those? If you live in the mountains, then you go skiing. If you live in the desert, you ride bikes or you run. You try and make it consistent. And this, this is a call for imagination. This is a call for creativity. We're really good at making up new sports, so let's do this. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this, this of course, here's another way to think of it. And, and this is what we need to do. We need to, um, these are our circles of life support. So the body is fundamental. It's supported in its life by habitat. It's supported by tribe and community and have some sense of meaning and purpose. These are our life support circles. And this is this diagram, if you will, should be up in every gym, every uh, yoga studio, every clinic around the world. This is what, this is fundamental in keeping us alive. And so here's the sapiens curriculum. And, and like we've said, it starts with big history, Every child in the world should be exposed to this thing because we're going into the unknown now. And these are the things that we have to do. And we could dig down into all of this, but this is what I would suggest every, every school should teach these things.
and looking for some kind of new old way, some kind of integration of the modern and the ancient that honors our ancestry. This is, this is vital. If we leave that behind, then we're really in trouble. And just finally, this is part of this call for creativity. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this is what Charlie's calling for here is a new model, a new way to practice our sports and do our physicality that is relevant to habitat. And this is, this is the creation that, that we need to make. So that is my presentation. Amen to that. I love that closing quote. And I'm a, a Buckminster Fuller fan as well. And I, I wonder if some of those ideas that he came up with just around uh, the, the physical infrastructure, I, I think some of that goes a long way towards resolving this paradox of keeping the best of technology uh, and not throwing the baby out with the bathwater necessarily, but saying that if we're serious about something like renewable energy or green technology, we have to confront resource scarcity from every angle. We can't just push the resource extraction out of sight, out of mind. And just because our cars might be running on uh, electricity instead of oil, doesn't mean that those costs aren't just getting shifted around to other places. So it's, it's a different way of seeing the world. Um, I think that Buckminster Fuller was born with a, like an optical defect that that made it so that he couldn't see things you know he didn't know what it meant to see clearly until he finally got glasses at the age of seven or so and then i think that that must have influenced his uh his way of seeing the world so right. and his, his word tensegrity is so important for all of us right now and if you don't know that word it's just it, it's embodied in the geodesic dome where every part of the structure relies on the rest of the structure for its its survival, if you will, and it's um, it's radically interdependent. So it's a structural manifestation of what we see in the natural world, where interdependence is the law of nature, if you will. And so it's a metaphor for what we need to create, and it's a great system. Yeah, this is a good segue into the the next part of our conversation here, which is trying to give some concrete examples that we use to uh, connect to our habitats. And speaking of structures and uh, kind of, my mind immediately goes to climbing structures. And I think of how a tree and just the system of, of roots in the tree and the way that the tree is designed. I'm not sure that it necessarily, I'm sure that there must be a tensegrity uh, component to, to trees. The fact that they are both flexible and strong uh, you have the, you know parts of it that are in tension and parts of it that are under compression. Um, so maybe we'll start, we can kind of alternate uh, giving examples or I can run through, I have a, a list of three examples of how I've used local habitat in the context of, uh, of my tribe, trying to be more physical and to get to know our environment better. Uh, but I know that you're a, a climber, so maybe you can lead off and talk about, you know, how does how do you relate to climbing, uh, and in your habitat? Right. Well, I was heavily influenced by uh, Yvonne Chouinard, and of course he was a climber in Yosemite, and I was I never met him, but I was in the valley at that time, and he was always very sensitive to context and habitat, and he was one of the guys who pioneered this idea of clean climbing and better technology to allow people to do this. And when I lived in California, it made sense for me to go to the valley and climb. That was, that was my habitat, if you will. But then I moved to Seattle and it occurred to me that, well, I can burn a bunch of fossil fuels to get back to the valley and go climb again, but that didn't feel right. It, it was, a, it was like a forced, um, transportation that I that I had to do to maintain my sport in that place but then I thought well there's plenty of things to do in Seattle and there's a million sports that I can practice there so you know think locally that was such a big right. theme for a long time and we can take that on in the sporting world as well yeah I want to plant this seed into in particular 
people who identify with the move net modality or any sort of primal movement modality uh, who are thinking about their their practice and with with regard to facilities i feel like the idea of a move net gym an indoor move net gym is a bit of a contradiction in terms it's not to say that there aren't certain things that can be done more safely and in a more controlled manner on indoor equipment but i i think that the possibilities outside of a facility are so much greater we can even start to think of ourselves as uh, almost like eco tour guides you don't need to go halfway around the world to uh, participate in eco tourism you can uncover what you have right in your backyard and that's what i've been trying to do uh to uh, with 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 some success actually in the past year and a half in particular really right at the start of the pandemic was when um, i first had this idea for a 50 mile march i calculated that it was 50 miles uh, around san francisco bay you could walk across all three bridges to some extent now i'm going to share my screen and just pull up uh, the route for this most recent 50 mile march uh, but the first one was was around san francisco bay starting on uh, treasure island and then making our way across we discovered that this was making our lives more difficult than it had to be because the road is almost entirely paved and you get some beautiful views i feel like i connected with the bay in a different way i'm a sailor but seeing the bay from every angle on foot helped me understand the area that i've lived my entire life uh, so much better and and just feel a connection to it that now i'm uh, more invested in in sort of protecting it this also gave us a little bit of a sense of tribal identity because during the lockdown people were saying oh don't go outdoors don't meet up with anyone and we thought that was a little bit excessive especially given what we've learned about the connection between comorbidity of with COVID and vitamin D status or metabolic syndrome. So it seems like locking down and staying sedentary was one of the worst things we, we could have done at that time. Uh, and, and so our, our tribe has coalesced around that idea. And I think that this fits in with that framework you just pointed out with the, the concentric circles and sort of meaning and purpose. We, I think that we can draw a sense of meaning and purpose from specific shared values partly where we live and there might be certain narratives that we latch on to that are related to our bioregion. And a couple of those that I would highlight from this year's 50 mile march, we started off in Point Reyes, here in the top left, Bear Valley Trailhead, made our way down the coast following uh, a path that includes something called the Miwok Trail. The Miwok Native Americans used to live in the, the land that's now Marin County. And I remember going on field trips as an elementary school student uh, seeing, you know, we I think we built some Thule canoes and launched them into the bay, uh, which was a technology of of the Miwoks. And uh, doing this march again uh, connected me with some of that experience of uh, not my ancestors, but uh, but but people with whom I I do share um, a common ancestor. Uh, and I think you have a, a term for our uh, our common ancestor in the in the sapiens curriculum can you remind me what's what's the term that you use there right, that's well it's not my term it, it's luca l-u-c-a and that stands for last universal common ancestor and if you want to go all the way back that some microbial organism some prokaryotic organism probably three billion years ago that gave rise to all the successive generations of life and that's Darwin's copiously branching bush. We are all part of that. And so Luca is what unites us. We've got, a, a, let's see, last, say it one more time, Luca, last? Last universal. Universal. Common okay, so the universal ex extends us and connects us to, to all life, but we can also maybe find uh, a, a last uh, human common ancestor. And, well, and I think that this is where you know there's there's the critique of sort of cultural appropriation and and it's not my intention to uh to take the the legacy of uh of the miwok and claim it as my own but big history gives us a lens to think about our own past as being that we do all share this experience if we go back far enough so even though i can't connect to maybe my ancient european or african or eurasian ancestors um, at, at least in my local area i can connect 
to the land that uh, that was once much more essential, uh, or at least I should say, just as essential, but that at that time uh, was much more a part of the everyday reality. So this was something that we will be an annual event now. We'll, we'll change the location, but uh, the tribe that has emerged through the process of things like this 50 mile march has been, I think, a lot stronger than a lot of the the friend groups and, and things that, that I've made around other activities that don't have this embodied component. Uh, another one from a couple of years ago, I was just looking through some old pictures of this swim that I did from Alcatraz to San Francisco, which is a little over a mile and people do it, people do it without the wetsuit, but it was uh, in January. And so we, we wore the wetsuits. And this was also something that I couldn't have done alone. Um, I think that this, there, there is the risk with things like ultra marathons or, or climbing feats of turning it into just the, the glorification of individual achievement. But in this case, we had to, to row out together in order to, uh, to have a, a way to, to make sure that we weren't stranded. Actually, my friend John here, he, he volunteered to try to tow the kayak back while he swam, which turned out to be too much drag but this is another tradition it's an embodied tradition that puts us uh, closer to our habitat um, and the alcatraz connection makes it for for those living in san francisco bay i actually have never even been to alcatraz in spite of the fact that i've lived here my whole life uh, and then one more the most recent example that i wanted to highlight was uh, this climbing structure that my natural movement group built uh, and constructed we actually built the, the top side of the structure on the water out in the Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta. And it's it's not quite a tensegrity structure, but it uses a lot of the same principles of tension and compression. Um, next year, I, I'd love to include some maybe like a geodesic dome or something like that. Uh, but you can see that it's, it's just made out of wood and these recycled food grade storage barrels. Uh, the picture on the left was uh, a very intense effort that was required when we noticed that the platform was listing over a little bit to one side turned out that one of the barrels had one of the little bung holes was a little bit loose so it took on some water and in order to pull out this 300 pound thing that had filled up halfway with water we had to use the the halyards on the boat which is something to use to hoist the sails up eventually using two halyards we got the thing high enough out of the water to be able to empty it out um, but this was uh not only a, a bonding experience for our tribe, but it uh, put us closer to the Delta, just being able to hang off of this platform and go swimming. Um, you can also see a cluster of uh, water hyacinth, which is one of the uh, species that grows pretty, pretty prodigiously in the Delta, um, almost to the point of being annoying, but you kind of, you, you come to, to see it as a, a, a part of nature that actually has a personality that gives a personality to the Delta. Um, I had a, a very profound moment actually sitting in a dinghy, just connecting with this with this water hyacinth as it undulated in the waves. Every time a boat would pass by, that it would just undulate in this very elegant way, and you can see how this species has uh, an intelligence to it and a personality. But it was only after spending about a week on the Delta that I came to connect with it in that way. Uh, so those are those are the examples of how my tribe has connected with with our local environment. Um, and I, I want to kick it back to you and maybe hear a little bit more about either the Outback experiences that you've hosted or other ways. You're up in, in Oregon where there's a, a river, uh, I believe, that maybe has a, a dam connected to it. Um, speak a little bit about sort of causes and, and why how, how this planetary cause um, can be brought down to the level of something local enough that we can feel like maybe we can make a difference. Right. Well, one of my passion projects is working on the Snake River Dam issue. And that's a monstrous issue because a, a huge area of habitat in eastern Oregon, Washington, and Idaho is affected by the dams on the Snake River, and they've, they've almost destroyed the salmon runs, which that's food for habitat, and that um, is leading to this impoverished habitat, 
in that area. And most people agree that the dams have to come down, but they're huge. And it, it would take a lot of effort on everybody's part to make that happen. So it, it needs effort from a lot of different directions. We need legal and activist energy. The nonprofits are in there, but also people are doing like a kayak uh, excursions on the Snake River to draw attention to the cause. And that's, that's good physical activity. And it makes sense. It's appropriate to that habitat. So that would be one way to, uh, to do it. Swimming in the Snake River and trying to get people um, more aware. All of those things are possible. So um, yeah, again, it comes down to creativity and doing what you can, trying to, uh, trying to bring your body into the modern challenge. And I think that there are some sports and recreational activities that people are already doing, even, you know, the running, the cycling, the hiking and climbing. These are sports that people recognize uh, where that can be a, an easier entry point. But getting outside of the box and thinking about things that that maybe put us more in a uh, primal way of engaging with the habitat. Um, any any thoughts there about just broadly, it doesn't have to be related to the Snake River or uh, what, what are some kinds of activities or even games maybe that you've done that you feel like help people connect to, to the land or the outdoors? My favorite toys are the medicine ball and the wobble board. And you could do a million things with a medicine ball and a wobble board. And that's not going to, that's not going to inhibit you. You don't need a vast modern apparatus to do things. But even with the medicine ball, which is a, a synthetic product, um, I don't know what it's plasticized rubber or something. I don't even know what's in it, but you can, there's rocks everywhere. You can, you could keep it really simple. I have a place where I go with my dog. We go for a hike. We're out a half mile or so, and I have a place where I've selected a few rocks, and those rocks have different purposes for me and different movements that I like to do with the rock. And it, you know, maybe it's not athletically correct. It maybe it's not biomechanically perfect, but I don't care because it's a it has a certain texture on my hands. I love that texture and whatever I allow the rock to dictate what I'm going to do. And maybe it's an overhead thing, but maybe it's too heavy. So I do a different movement or there's plenty, there's plenty to do. <laughs> Yeah, and now on this this last question I want to deal with is has to do with uh, growing the the movement, and I think that you know we can we can talk about all these concepts and principles, but at the end of the day, it's it's going to be I think a decentralized process of people figuring out what their local habitats are. You know, you and I can't. Uh, go every to every bioregion and and plant the seeds of this, but we can try to inspire people to come up with their own creative ideas and explore it in their own context. Uh, based on your studies of biology in particular, we didn't talk about this beforehand, so I'm giving you a little bit of a curveball here. What are your thoughts on what makes for successful propagation of something that's kind of like an idea, like this idea of the outdoor movement movement. Um, you know, does it take a, a celebrity to endorse it or how can it grow organically? Right, well, celebrity voices can be useful, but what I can talk about is what inspires me. And I am inspired by people who take risks to move things forward in culture. And we've got a lot of personal trainers out in the world, and they could be taking leadership roles in this kind of thing. And they could be speaking out, and they could be taking on these positions and urging their clients, their students, their, their people to maybe try a new way. And that would inspire more people to do the same. Speaking out on these issues is really powerful. Um, one of my favorite athletes 
is Colin Kaepernick because precisely for that reason. I mean, this is a guy, he was talking about social issues, but he put his entire career on the line for what he believed was something bigger than sports. And so he's had a profound impact on me and other people as well, I'm sure. So I think that the athletes among us, I'm putting out the call to these folks to start stepping up start talking about the planet and looking for ways to make athletics and sports relevant. And every time you speak out and take a risk there, you're going to bring, bring people into the system. Sure. Uh, you know, if we can get some celebrities on board, that'd be great, but it's, it's making ourselves vulnerable is what is I think going to pull people along. So taking risks and making yourself vulnerable. I'm also hearing that, you know, tying it to a cause and whether that cause is the, the entire planet or whether it's some local environmental issue or it could be some other issue of, of health or, or in the case of my tribe here in Berkeley, we've really coalesced around the, the freedom to move, the freedom to uh, get, you know, get together in person at a time when that was a little bit controversial and that, that made us vulnerable to, to some criticism. Uh, but I, I hear you talking about risks and to me it's the it's an exciting call it's a, a call to think outside of the the traditional roles that we've been that we've inherited from the, the past several generations of you know you're you're either this or you're this you're either a, an environmental activist or you're a personal trainer trying to meld some of these roles together you're either a uh you know a, a freedom activist or a uh, health consultant or something like this, right. recognizing that no one, and especially maybe that, you know, the experts do not have a monopoly on these issues. And if we're waiting for the solutions to come from some outside entity or, or just for the, the, the traditional expert consensus, um, they might be great at diagnosing the problem of, of the planet. But if, if we're counting on them to actually step up and provide the solution, I think we're going to be waiting for a very long time. Right, right. And this is something I've noticed. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in a corporate gym, but I have been in corporate gyms from time to time. And I pay particular attention to whatever posters are on the wall and what kind of messaging is coming across in a corporate gym. And they're always the same. They're always about performance and being a better you, but there's no activism at all in a corporate gym, at least that I've seen. And I've often wondered about that. And the, the explanation that I hear is that, well, we, we can't do that because some people are going to be unhappy if we take a position on, for example, the planet. And so we can't do that because this is a corporate gym and we're, we're not going to stick our necks out because we have to make a, you know, a welcoming environment for everybody. But if we're going to have a functional future as a people on this earth, people are going to have to take some risks. And this is the time to do it because the pandemic stirred everything up and now we've got opportunity. So I would say go for it. Amen. I, I think uh, the corporate model of fitness, it, it has some strengths, perhaps you could say, like something like the CrossFit franchise has introduced a lot of people to a form of movement that they find fulfilling that otherwise might not have found. And that is a community for a lot of people. But I think that we might look at it for a different model when it comes to the outdoor movement movement, uh, not only in the sense of breaking out of the, the standard exercise facilities and the model of exercise qua exercise. Um, and this might be a segue into a, the, just this final thing that I teased at the beginning, which is the uh, the contest, the photo contest, where we're, we're putting out a call to people to uh, take a picture of themselves, ideally with their tribe, with their community, and send it to us. You can send it to me. Um, you can email me at ecologicaldoctor at gmail.com or at chdice at gmail.com. Um, Frank, you're welcome to, to give out an email address, but you don't have to. Um, there, there are plenty of ways to get in touch with us. You can also post a picture directly into this event page, which will stick around for some time to come. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to, let's see, one sec, I'm just going to share this last slide here to 
make it official that we are uh, announcing this photo contest for for anyone who might already have a group of people whether you're you know a move nat trainer or just someone who uh, has a group of friends that likes to go out hiking um, take a picture of your tribe in your local habitat moving outdoors and the the most creative one will win a copy of these two paperbacks frank i'm gonna i'm gonna order the paperback i've been reading the kindle version uh, but maybe i can order it directly from you and we can even sweeten the pot by making it a signed copy or something like that uh, after the fact but um th this is because I'm, I'm trying to not only inspire people with different ideas but also really make this a uh, if not a, a, a viral campaign, then at the very least, something that makes ripples and waves out in the world. And we'll revisit this at some point in the future and see what came out of it, what kinds of tribes uh, there are. And then lastly, I notice your shirt has a, uh, I think that's a domain name. Yes. Um, I'll bring it back to you. Tell us about this domain name, because this might also be a way to, um, to give enough structure for the, the growth of the outdoor movement movement um, without having it fall into a, a corporate vessel where then these things like liability start to come into play. Right, well, this is a, a extremely ambitious idea that I have. Um, I own the domain life.earth and I wondered what I was gonna do with it. And my fantasy is to have a bioregional website where people can hover over their bioregion and discover what is going on in that bioregion. And that would include, um, imagine a Wikipedia style template there with everything from flora and fauna and weather and water, plants, animals, the whole thing, but also human activities and also including um, human culture and human athletics and sports and whatever is appropriate to that bioregion. And I think it would be an extremely powerful thing to do, but also really ambitious and would require some serious support, financial support, computer support, all of that. And that's, um, that's my passion project, if you will. So maybe you'll see that coming at some point if I can get some uh, support on that one. I'd love to see it. I'd love to make that happen. And then to be a ambassador for the Bay Area in terms of filling out this Wikipedia style page. And I know that e even as I've walked around the Bay or walked from Point Reyes to San Francisco or swum from here to there, I still am only scratching the surface. And if you compare my understanding and connection to the either the Ohlone that lived in Berkeley or the Miwok that lived in Marin County, I'm a total beginner. So we'll need hundreds, if not thousands of people in each bioregion to be populating it with different ideas and photographs and videos uh, talking about, you know, what is this plant? What can you eat? I might go pick some blackberries after this because it's uh, peak season right now and the blackberries are just bursting off the trees. But that would be one of my contributions to this map. Yes, yes. And um, who knows what it could become? I mean, if we got a few thousand people contributed to it, that would draw more people in every time. Every time somebody clicked on that, they'd say, oh, I'm curious about that. And it could even revise the way um, governments are organized too. And that would be truly transformational. So big ideas. <laughs> Indeed. Well, Frank, any other closing comments here or uh, insights you want to impart to our audience? Well, I, I, Jumping back to our last uh, bit of conversation and people who are doing good work in the world, I would also point to yoga and yoga studios because what I'm seeing with some yoga practitioners is that they're saying, well, yoga doesn't have to be in a studio. It doesn't have to be indoors. You know, maybe when the weather's bad, it does, but there's plenty of people taking their yoga outside and plenty of yoga teachers who are moving in this direction. Mm -hmm. So that is a that's a built-in community that I think already has a certain sensitivity to this. And if we could harness that, that would be another thing. Go outside, do your yoga in habitat. And when the weather gets really nasty, go indoors, of course. But that is another um, jumping off point, if you will. So, yeah. I love it. And maybe, maybe platforms like meetup.com, uh, the meetup group that I 
I've been a part of and, and a, a co-leader of for the past couple of years. We we center on meetup. That's how we attract most new members outside of just word of mouth. And then increasingly, we've been communicating on the the Signal platform, which is kind of a uh, encrypted. Uh, it doesn't have to be encrypted for the the kinds of things that we're talking about, but uh, it does feel like a little bit of a subculture, um, if 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 not uh, slightly subversive to the the current powers that be. So it's going to be an interesting, and as I mentioned at the beginning, it's going to be a, a wild ride. I think that we're on the verge of some big changes planetarily and socially, and it will be the groups of people that, that can stick together and, and find ways to become more resilient uh, using their, their local habitat as the, the, the training ground, so to speak, and also considering it as their, their true life support system, as you pointed out. Right, right. Another way to think of this, too, is that you're part of a, a project now. This is a thousand year project. I mean, we're not going to revise modern culture overnight. We are generating a narrative that is going to take a long time. So we're, what we're doing is start with a seed and trying to hand this off to other people and to our descendants. And hopefully they'll pick it up as well. So it's, uh, be patient. <laughs> take your time. Well said, and that that gives me the the uh, super substantial food that I need to to go out into the world and keep doing this. Um, so thank you, Frank. I, I'm really appreciative. Every time we talk, I come away with new insights. And the that one in your presentation that, that I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to find that book of the the song lines of the people in Australia, because that seems like especially fertile ground for. Uh, for, for reconnecting with our landscape. And maybe on the next 50 mile march, we'll, we'll sing certain songs at particular milestones. Oh, I'd love to see the video. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still hoping that we'll get a chance to meet in person soon. Yes, me too. All right, thanks, thanks Frank again. And, and for those of you tuning in, you can find Frank at uh, Exuberant Animal. That's both the website and the Facebook and I believe the YouTube channel We'll have this video up on the YouTube channel, hopefully, as well. And that's it for now, saying so long. And be, last thing is be sure to go out and check out the Sapiens Curriculum, Teacher's Guide for an Age of Turmoil. Thanks so much, Frank. Thank you. Loved it. Loved it.